Very good. So last speaker of the morning session is Faye Dauker, telling us, telling us about how things happen. So as the last speaker of the day, I have the happy duty of giving my, well first my personal thanks to the organisers of this meeting for um, inviting me and letting me um, speak, but also on to express the thanks of all of us, um, so I'm now speaking on your behalf, in saying to um, Alex and Hugh and Christy um, and Dean, and most particularly also to Rod, um, thank you so very, and also to, to George, thank you so very much for um, organising this wonderful meeting. I have enjoyed every single minute of it, every aspect of it. It's been really wonderful to meet um, new friends as well as greet um, old ones. And I, yeah, it's been a really wonderful um, experience and bringing together such a diverse set of people who all have something to say to each other. It's been really great. So let's all thank um, Is this actually on? Is it? No, it no, it doesn't sound. Can I do? Can I try and do without it? Is that all right? Yeah. No, uh, it could be better for the recording if you if you have it. Oh, uh, could okay. Press the button. And hold it. Yeah, for a seventy-eight holders for a while. Agree. That's on now. No, we're good. I think now it went off. That's all good. Should get a green light. Okay. Okay, I'll do my best with it. Okay. Good. So I'm also very lucky because I'm the last speaker. I can hang my talk on all the wonderful talks that um, have already happened um, this week. So I'm going to refer to lots of people's talks as I go through, so that was really nice for me as I was looking over my um, notes last night, I realised that there were so many um, thoughts and aspects of other people's talks that um, I'm going to be using, and in particular I'm really going to be just filling out the details of the last part of Raphael's talk, so all of the questions that you were asking him you can ask me again and I can try and maybe, I won't do better than him, but I might just say everything all over again, and maybe that will that will help you to um, um, to get more idea of what it is that we're um, that we're suggesting with causal sense. So here, I've learned over many years of giving talks to always start with the conclusion, because you never finish a talk, and um, it's always better that people actually hear the, what you actually want to say. Um, so my conclusion is. Just a rephrasing of um, Raphael's conclusion at the end of his talk that the absence of a globally defined time is compatible with a physical process of becoming. <coughs> so, here are some introductory remarks. Relativity, as we heard um, beautifully from Carlo in the opening talk, both special and general relativity, teaches us that the concept of simultaneity is not a physical one. There's no physical global now. So here's a picture Carlo drew of the space-time. So this is space-time, the past is down here, the future is up here, and any event in space-time, like something like A, like that, here, is either to the causal past of an event such as B, in, a, in other words, what happens at A can influence what happens at B, or it's to the causal future of an event like D, so what happens at D can influence what happens at A, or two events might be causally unrelated. So A, nothing that happens at A can happen can influence anything that happens at C or vice versa. They just have no causal relation at all. And there's no sense in which A happens before C or C happens before A. There is a sense in which A happens before B, and there is a sense in which D happens before A, and there is a sense in which D happens before B, but A and C are causally unrelated. There's no sense in which they are um, simultaneous. There's no physical sense to that. And one reason that the scientific advance that relativity represents is so emotionally satisfying to us, I claim, is that this better scientific understanding 
accords with our more intuitive, and what I learned from um, Teresa's talk, a more childlike understanding of the local nature of time. Perhaps very difficult, apparently, what I learned, to teach children about clocks and calendars. It's not something, it's something that you have to drill into them and drum into them. It's not something that, 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 they, that they, it's not the way they experience time. So it's often emphasized the, the break from our intuition, intuitive notion of time that we have to make when we um, learn about relativity. Um, and that's it's often expressed as being very mysterious, as being very, um, very counterintuitive. But I would like to emphasize that, in fact, it accords much more closely to a, a deeper, perhaps more primitive, more, more, more childlike um, understanding that, that time, we experience time locally, and the sense that there's something going on right now, very, very far away, is something that perhaps we need to have imposed upon us, or is imposed upon us by what um, Chris um, described as the clocks and calendars, which are, and Chris, you'll have to help me out with your phrase again. Sorry. <laughs> oh, symbolic company. Yes, Martin. thank you. Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> so the physical world is best understood, according to general relativity, as having a four-dimensional character. It is a space-time. To do justice to our perception of the passage of time, whilst maintaining this space-time nature of reality, this four-dimensional nature of reality, a growing block, a model of a growing block of space-time seems natural, as we heard um, from George, and as was described um, in Jeremy's talk also. This requires a process of becoming, as Raphael described. So let us accept from relativity that the order in which causally unrelated events, like A and C, the, that, the order in which those happen is not physical. Events, and that events are only partially ordered. So if you think about all these events in space-time, there's only a partial order on them. Some events just don't have an order. This event and this event, they're ordered. This comes first, and this, uh, uh, this one becomes, um, comes before this one, this one comes before this one. But the, the order is only partial. So you think of all the events, there's only a partial order on them. Can one think of general relativity in such a way that this concept, that a concept of the partially ordered coming into being of space-time points, or what Raphael calls asynchronous becoming, can be identified within it. Well, one problem that at least I have with trying to make that, um, trying to locate in general relativity this process of asynchronous becoming, is that space-time in general relativity is continuous. Um, and this is the continuity of, of space-time, the um, the assumption of the continuity of space-time is an ancient and persistent problem in understanding space and time, as Carlo described um, beautifully in his talk. So those are the introductory remarks. So causal set theory is an approach to the problem of quantum gravity, the problem of, of restoring to physics a unified, the unified framework that it's sort of lost since the um, beginning of the 20th century. And I call it the marriage of atomicity and causality. And this idea, this approach, was independently um, proposed by Etoft, by Meerheim, by Bombelli, Lee, Meyer, and Sorkin, and Raphael has championed it particularly um, since then. So this causal set approach to the problem of quantum gravity is based on twin hypotheses that space-time is fundamentally atomic, it's made, it's made of atoms, space-time atoms, discrete atoms, and of all the properties that the continuum space-time possesses, it is the causal structure, exactly this structure, this, all this information about which events are causally related or not to which other events, it's that structure that persists as physical at the smallest scales. Now, the concept of atomicity has an ancient pedigree, and it's likely to be fruitful in quantum gravity. That's something which um, is a, 
a, a common theme amongst different approaches to quantum gravity. For example, in explaining the finiteness of the black hole entropy and giving a well-defined path integral, as Raphael described. And the scale at which space-time is expected to become atomic is the Planck scale, so which is an extraordinarily tiny scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimetres is a Planck length, 10 to the minus 43 seconds is a Planck time. <coughs> so the scales at which the atomicity kicks in, sets in, are well, way smaller than, than everyday scales, certainly way smaller than scales which are probed at that um, even way smaller than scales that are probed at particle physics experiments like the LHC at CERN. That causality is a more basic organizing principle for events, even than space and time, is also an ancient um, tradition. So the idea, so space, the concept of space time is just a way to organize these events. We organize them in, in, in a particular way, we put coordinates on our on this manifold of events. But another way to organize them would be just to give all of this information, all the information about the, about the, the causal ordering of the events. That's just a different way to organize and talk about the events in space in and of space time. And what causal set theory claims or bases itself upon is that these two concepts of causality and atomicity, the fact that that the, there's a fundamental discreteness to reality and that causal order is, is more basic than space-time, can complete each other and from which, um, and from their marriage, space-time can emerge. By the way, um, I prefer if you ask me questions while I'm giving the talk than, um, than if than saving them to the end, so just, yeah, just chip in. yeah. I, maybe it'll turn out that I should have saved this to the end, but if, if it does turn out, that I just tell me, um, or save it for later. So, there is a, so, but the spirit I get from what you've said so far is to, is to sort of reduce talk about space-time to talk about causal relations, okay? We have this set of points, we, we have this set of you know, dots or, or whatever they are, um, um, we primitively posit causal relations between them. And from those, in certain approximations, in certain limits, we can recover our usual ideas about space-time and see why they work so well, and, and blah, blah, blah. This is a picture, I think, that's been described here with admirable clarity. But once it's described at that level of clarity, I'm completely at a loss as to what it might have to do with becoming. Um, um, it seems like a structure that's just as much always there as the full space-time structure. It's just that the relations between the, the, the primitive relations between the points aren't spatial temporal relations, they're causal relations from which we later think we can derive spatial temporal relations. Um, and that seems really clear. That seems like a promising, interesting program. I'm just puzzled why there's a thought that, it, that it's any more sympathetic than ordinary space-time structure to ideas of becoming. For me, the atomicity, I mean, I'll show you the model of, of causal set growth that Raphael described. And I'll show you the movie of it. And um, that model is, is the reason that I think that I mean, it's not, it's not something which, which we started out with to, to recover becoming. So the, this model came about because we wanted, to, first of all, we want to have a quantum dynamics for causal sets. We want to do quantum gravity. And it was in warming up for that quantum problem and trying to do the best we could in making a, a classical stochastic model for, for a dynamics for causal sets was in, in trying to build such a model that this, this um, classical sequential growth model came out of that program. So it didn't, we didn't set out to recover becoming or find becoming there. It was, it, the way we feel about it is that it's been forced upon us. So we just have no clue, no idea how to, how to write down, postulate, uh, propose a dynamics 
for, for a causal set, so an action, for example, or a, 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 some, so, no, some equation for motion for a causal set. No idea how to do that except in the context of something which grows. That it's sort of the the feeling that that becoming is somehow necessary to causal sex has come upon us as part of this scientific program. But, so I'm not I can't can't give you all those experiences that sure. we've had to, to, to give you that feeling as well. But yeah. but here's the question. Yeah. It, this is I take it the question Wayne brought up um, um, yeah. in Raphael's talk. It sounds like the following procedure would be mathematically equivalent. You write all the dots down, and then you start drawing, drawing lines between them that express certain relationships, causal relationships, you know, parent-descendant uh, parent relationships, so on and so forth. This sounds exactly like taking space time, drawing all the events, um, um, stipulating spatio-temporal relations, it seems, yes, of course, you can show a movie of it in either case, which traces it along the time parameter or traces it along the descendant parameter or the causal parameter. Then you'll see something growing. But it seems like people have expressed exactly the same information by writing down all the dots at once, stipulating what the causal relations between them are, and then you're done. So let me just say one thing, and then we'll, let's come back to it, because it's obviously a persistent, persistent discussion that right. we're going to have. Sure. Uh, and I don't mean to hold you up. Yeah, yeah. To me, the two models, are di they're physically distinct. If you have a model, as Wayne just, I mean, you can always run the process to infinity, right. think about the process right. from that point of view. You just have the, the, the infinite causal sets run forever, <laughs> and there's a probability distribution on them. You can always think about it like that. Right. But the, 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 the model with becoming, to me, is physically different. There's a physical process in one, and not a physical process in the other. They're just physically different. They're physic. I don't. How do I? I don't know how to express that any more than that. I mean, I'll try again later, but for now, let me just. Yes. This may be an entirely relevant question. In, in psychology, and, and I understand philosophy as well, um, people work with two very different notions of causation sometimes. So, mm -hmm. um, on. Kind of popular notion at the minute to say that A causes B is just to say that if, if you're able to intervene on A in some way, you're somehow able to change the state of being. Okay? Um, but you can contrast that notion of causation with the idea to, to say that A causes B is, is to say that there's some kind of mechanism connecting um, connecting the two things. And then you have to spell out what you mean by mechanism. And so um, there, there's quite a lot of division in literature about which of those notions of causation you actually buy into. Um, I just wonder, is that, does, it, does, does that matter for anything that, you're, that you want to say? Or? Um, I'm what? sure it probably does and should. Uh, so here, I guess we're using the first notion, right. that there's a potential causal influence that, can, that something that happens here can, can influence something that happens there. So that it's a more kind of structural causal order that is not set, is not making a is not um, is not yet to do with with actual something actually actually propagating from A to B. Just one very brief comment. I completely completely agree completely with what you're saying. Causality, of course, is a very complex word with many dimensions. We could talk about, it. but the one just thing I just want to comment on is that. In relativity, because we draw light cones, we seem to say to ourselves causality is important along light light rays. Actually, in the real universe, most of the important causality takes place on time like lines, not on light rays. So the causal relation is both time like and null. So, so yeah, so it, it includes both time like and null relations. But the individual links are thought of as light like. They're as close to what one might think mean by light like as one can get in a discussion. I think, that, I think that, yeah. that's what we need to discuss actually, because I think I could make a case there should be time like, not time like. Okay. I think that the point of this is very good. <coughs> and in the answer, Ralph's answer was very good, and the key uh, point was uh, potential, possibility of what you had. So I think here what we talked about is not causality in any of the two 
Uh, you, you indicated that, but uh, um, the cultural relation we talk about are the ones which are uh, necessary in condition uh, physical ground for any of the ones that you refer to, 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 to happen. So it says. Thank you. I wonder if I can make a suggestion. I mean, Fay has already given us her conclusion. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can stop I'm, that. I'm very keen to know how she gets to where she is now. To the conclusion, and I'm worried that at the rate of questioning we have, that's not going to happen. So, despite love, those preferences, I'd like to propose that you just wait till the end for more questions. It's a, always a difficult one. I, I prefer, I would very, very happy not to give the rest of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we just have, you know. <laughs> okay. So, Bravo didn't give you the definition of a causal set. So, this is my most technical slide. So. Um, you can just tune out for the next um, minute or two. But I thought I'd just like to show you the, the mathematical definition of a causal set. So the causal set hypothesis is that the deep structure of space-time is a causal set. Um, and a way, another name for a causal set might be a discrete order. So it's an, it's an order, a partial order. So it's a set of, of elements, C, and it has a binary relation <coughs> Um, I think it was Jeremy also who's used this um, curly less than or equal to sign, which we'll refer to as precedes, and it satisfies these three conditions. <coughs> so if A precedes, X precedes Y, and Y precedes then Z, then X precedes Z, that's what we call transitivity. So if D is to the past of A, and A is to the past of B, then D is to the past of B, so it's transitive. It's acyclic, meaning there are no closed loops in the order. So you can't have an event preceding another event, which then precedes the first one. So that would be, people call it um, somewhat jokingly, um, time machines um, or closed time-like loops. That's where you go back into your, uh, can go back into the past. So it's, we can kind of rule that out by fiat um, in causal sets. It's not. It's, uh, I could say more about that if you want to ask me about that. And then it's discrete, or what stands for discreteness in the definition is what's called local finiteness. So that for any ordered pair of elements, X and Z, so X precedes Z in the, in the set of elements, the set of space-time atoms, the cardinality of the set of element <coughs> Y, such that Y, X precedes Y, and Y precedes Z is finite. So they're just finitely many events, finitely many elements of the set C that lie in between any two other elements. So I want to contrast that to the case in the continuum. So in general relativity, that's not true. So A precedes B. If you think of all the events of space-time which lie to the future of A, but to the past of B, there are infinitely many of those points because this space-time is, in general relativity, continuous. It's a continuum. There are infinitely many points here. But in a causal set, that's not true. There are only finitely many elements of a causal set that, that um, lie in causally in between any two other um, events, any two other elements, any two other atoms. So the first two axioms say that uh, just the mathematical expression, uh, just the mathematical definition of what's called a partial order, so this set of uh, element set of atoms is a partial order. The third axiom is what makes the set discrete, makes it atomic. Um, yep, so these atoms of C are conceived of as the atoms of space-time. So how can such a thing look like a continuum space-time to us? So on, the first thing to say is that the scale of these atoms is very tiny, so this Planck scale, so making up some, some everyday um, piece of space-time, there are huge numbers, 10 to the 140-odd um, um, space-time atoms. So the discreteness is just not going to be um, going to be uh, observable to us on everyday scales, probably. And the second thing, the second way that um, that such a, a sort of sparse object, such as uh, this discrete order, could give us back continuous space time, it could be the underpinning to continuous space time, is that the causal order in general relativity. So if I in the continuum now, back in the, in the context of the continuum, 
if you're given just this information about the space-time cause of order, then you can recover everything about uh, uh, Lorentzian geometry, except for one, one piece of information. So you can recover the topology, including the dimension, you can recover the differentiable structure, and nine-tenths of the geometry, and of course the causal, the causal structure itself. And this idea that causal order is somehow a more fundamental way to think about space-time has been um, present in, in relativity since um, very early on. Um, these are some of the names of people who um, have contributed to that, that um, idea. But there is something missing from just causal order, and that is physical scale. So again, I was very, it was nice to think about how children learn about time and how they have very early on a concept of order of, of events in time. And that, but to give them time duration, time distance, time length, is actually something extra that you need. So to understand time, you need the ordering event, but you also need to know how, how, how far away in time by a metric relation um, thing, events are. So someone was saying, I think it was, you were saying that your, your child, you, you measure out time for him using sleeps. So if you want to say we're going to, going to, the, going to the zoo it'll, you know, in three days, it'll be in three sleeps time. So it, it's measuring it by numbers of events, not just by some abstract concept of, of, of abstract time ticking away somehow. It's really, you mark it out in terms of events. So, so you don't have that in a continuum. Because if you want to mark out the time that elapses as you move through space-time from A to B, there's a continuum, a whole infinitude of, of, um, of space-time points in between A and B in general relativity. There's no marking, there's, no, there's, there's nothing to, to count as you go from A to B. But in a discrete order, in a causal set, if this is really just some discrete thing, this is just an, this smooth continuum is just an approximation to a bunch of discrete events which are which are happening underlying this or as the, as the genuine physical reality. Then you do know how far it is from here to here in time because you can just count these events. I don't mean that that you can because you know there's ten to the forty three Planck times ticking away in, um, in a second, so I don't mean you're literally counting it, but fundamentally, that atomicity gives you physical scale. So in order to account for space-time as we know it, we need to provide causal order and physical scale, and we know it's a theorem that causal order and physical scale will give you back the whole geometry of, gen of general relativity. Yes? Just point of clarification. When you say that uh, you can include or recover the dimension, differential structure, yes. and so many other things, I assume you need to add some more axioms than just the partial order. Yes, structure. yes. So yeah. this this is in the continuum. So if you know that you have a continuum space, so you start with with a set of of elements which is a continuum space time, and you know, and then you're given the information of the causal order and and, um, and just the causal order. Then you can tell its topology, its dimension, and everything. But you, but for a general causal set, that this is this this is this doesn't mean anything for a general causal set. Yes, it's only in the continuum that this this is a theorem. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. We hope that the quantum dynamics of causal sets will do that. But it's a hope, rather. It's a hope, yes. So far, it's a hope. So it's typically the case with these approaches. You make things discrete and less structured, and this means that you can calculate many other things, and other people can't calculate them. The price of pegging is that the space time with the structure and the placement at the end of the phase. Yes, it's Pandora's box. Once you, once you give up on something, you open the door, in physics, you open the door to all the things which are not like that, right? So, 
So, and those have to be included in your theory, otherwise you're assuming what you want to prove. So, so we've got, yes, so we've opened the door now to, to all the myriad, vastly more numerous causal sets which look nothing like manifolds, indeed. Pandora's yeah. box. There, yes, Pandora's box, indeed. I'm just going to skip over this for lack of time, but it's a beautiful quote from um, Riemann in his um, Habilitation Schrift. Don't forget to let the hope come out of Pandora's box before you close it. Hope is just... I'm full of hope. <laughs> okay, so a discrete order, causal order can be sufficient to recover space-time, and this is Raphael's slogan, order plus number equals geometry, which is very beautiful. So the order of the causal set of this discrete atoms, the order of the atoms, gives rise in the continuum approximation to the space-time causal relation. Counting the number of causal set elements gives the missing physical scale. So here's um, this beautiful example, which I'm going to use from now on. Um, and atomicity, as I've said before, is likely to be fruitful for quantum gravity, um, but it also happens to be exactly what is necessary if one wants to make space-time pure causal order. Suppose you were sort of philosophically inclined to make causal order the basis for, um, for physics, basis for reality, then you can't go any further in the continuum. You can't make it the full thing because you need to add physical scale. But atomicity gives you the physical scale for free. So if you have an atomic theory, you get physical scale. In the, the manifold of events contains within itself physical scale. Okay, so the models I'm going to show you that embody asynchronous becoming were constructed, as I was explaining to um, David, as a classical analog and warm-up exercise for a quantum theory of causal set dynamics. And this is based on our understanding and understanding of quantum theories, generalization of classical stochastic processes. So here's another slogan. Quantum causal set dynamics will be, to class this model that I'm going to show you, classical sequential growth, as quantum mechanics is to Brownian motion. So the relationship between these, um, we think, will be, will, yeah, is um, analogous. Okay. So here, I'm going to show you a causal set growing. So this is a, um, just a cartoon of, of the model. So in the growth of a causal set, which is uh, to be thought of as a space-time, first of all, there's nothing, right? And then one space-time atom is born. And then another one is born. I'm going to use this word and then, but in a moment I'm going to take away those and then. So and then another element is born, and it chooses randomly, so with some probability, to be above, in other words, to the future of this one, or not. So it, and there's not just some, it, there's some roll of the dice, some, some um, toss of the coin, and it, the new element is born, and it chooses to be born above this one, so to the future of it, or just unrelated, called the unrelated. To it. So suppose it chooses to be above it. Okay, that's just one choice that it could have made. And then another one is born, and the one, the next one that's born, chooses at random which of these already born elements, already existing elements, it wants to have as its ancestor. It just chooses them at random, and say so it chooses that it wants to be above both of them, like that. And then another one is born, and then another one, and then this one decides that it wants to be above this, this part of the causal set, etc. I think that end, that I end there. So that's just one realization of this stochastic process, which resulted in this, um, this small finite causal set. So it's a stochastic, this is a stochastic process of continual births of new space-time atoms. No atom is born to the past or below any already existing atom. Otherwise, any order of birth is possible. Two different runs, which result in this same causal set, are physically the same process. So here's another way that that same causal, ooh, sorry, that wasn't the end, there was another one. Oh, and another one. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to generate so generate the same causal set, but just in a different order of births. So that one's born, then it goes up to the right instead of up to the left, that one, then that. 
then we build up that bit first, and then we go back and build up that bit. Okay. So that's just a different order for generating the same causal set. And the idea is that, that, that the difference between those two processes is not a physical difference. They are physically the same process. The only thing physical about the, this order is the resulting causal order that the space-time atoms have generated for themselves. And the, all the rest of that order of birth, the and then and then and then, is pure gauge. It has no physical meaning, no physical relevance. Okay. That's the idea, but can that be implemented? How do we realize, how do we capture that, that unphysicality of the order in which these things are born? Uh, the, the, um, the different, seemingly different processes that result in the same causal set, how do we realize that? And can we realize that mathematically? What's, what's the expression of that, of that um, covariance in the mathematics? Okay, so this is uh, a ma the manifestation of the question of how general covariance, in other words, coordinate independence of physical um, statements and the physics in general relativity, how is that manifested um, in a discrete setting? So that in a discrete setting, instead of coordinates, you have labels, labels for the space-time atoms. And in that birth process, those atoms acquired labels. They acquired labels given by the process. So the, the, the first one was labeled zero, the next one that was born was labeled one, the next one that's born is labeled two. Yes? Are you saying that two particles which by physics today would be considered indistinguishable? They are identical. There is some sense in which they have a kind of personal label or whatever. Which so the, these these are atoms of space time. So they're 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 not particles. Okay. But they they and in a causal set in a causal set um, in causal set theory, the space time atoms are not individuated in any other way apart from their relations with the other atoms. So they, they don't have any identity in and of themselves, but they 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 acquire their identity through their through their causal relations with the other. So I'm not sure that answers your question. Okay. And they're not labeled with history. They're not. They labeled. are history. Then they're not labeled with um. Well, ostensibly, this one comes with labeling because I generated it in a in a particular order. Oops. So this order gives it a label, seemingly gives it a label. So that I label zero. That one I label, this atom I label one, two, three. So, so that process is a labeling. That process in itself is a labeling of this, of this causal set. And this process, oops, is a different labeling. Yeah, so this one's zero, and that one's one, and that one's two, and that one's three. So it's a different labeling. But, but the, idea is, they don't retain the idea is that those, that labeling is, is not physical. There's no physical meaning to, to that, being, that being zero, and that being one, or this being one. There's no, there's, no, there's no meaning to that label. The only meaning for this, physical meaning to this causal set, is that this point, this atom, is to the future of these two and that one. That's the only meaning. That the, the actual number that I associate to that because of this process has no meaning. That's, so that's the idea, but can one... Empirically inconsequential? It's empirically physically, inconsequential. physically inconsequential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Physically unmeaningful. Yeah. I, I want to impose the rule that no one asks until the end. Right. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Have I run over no. massively? Good. So the question is, can we realize, is that possible? I mean, that, that's the concept, right? That those, those, those physical process, those two processes are physically identical and the order in which seemingly the, the atoms were born should be, should be unphysical. And the only physical um, content of the, of, of the causal set is the relations that the causal sets have, them, have within them, um, between themselves. Okay. So the, one way to express that is that there should be a condition that the probabilities, I said that this was a stochastic process. So each newly born element chooses stochastically, according to some probability distribution, 
which elements it wants as its ancestor, it's going to have as its ancestors. That's a, that's a stochastic process. So there's a probability, I'll go back now, for, to, to arrive at, so there's a probability that it chooses to be above this one. And there's a probability that this one chooses to be above that one. So we multiply those probabilities together to arrive at the probability of getting this causal set. So the probability to get the, this causal set this way should be the same as the probability that you get it this way. And that's an, exp that's an expression of this condition of discrete general covariance. We want the dynamics to be label invariant, to be invariant on the labels. And that restricts the models. And a classical sequential growth model satisfies this condition. But we're able to satisfy it, and we're able also to satisfy another condition, which is um, called Bell causality because it's the analog of the condition that would give rise to the Bell inequalities um, in, um, in, um, in physics in which there's a, there is a space-time background. Okay. So I'm going to tell you what the model is, just very um, briefly. So as Raphael described to you, it's characterized by a set of parameters. So these parameters, was, um, in principle, there can be an infinite number of them. They're positive numbers, t0, which is just for convention taken to be 1, t1, t2, t3. They're just some positive numbers. And suppose at some stage of the dynamics, there's some causal set which is, which is grown. And the new element is born. And it chooses to be above some some um, of the elements that have already some of the atoms that are already that already exist. And the way it does it is this: it ch it chooses a particular subset of the already existing causal set. And if that subset has cardinality k, in other words, if it has um, k elements in it, then the probability that this element chooses to be above it is subset with cardinality k, the probability that you put this element above this set of elements is given by t k. So that's, it, uh, sorry, the relative probability. So it's relatively, the, re the probability, the ratio of the probability that it, it puts itself above or to the future of a set of elements with k elements um, to the probability that it puts itself above a set, of element, a set with um, k or with um, l elements is this ratio. So this is the probability of choosing um, k elements for its ancestors, and the probability of choosing l. Okay. Once it's done that this object that you created might not be a causal set because, for example, suppose we already have this as our causal set and the new element is born. It could choose to be above this one, but not above that one. Right? So it could choose as its ancestors this one, but not above that one. But that's not, a la that's not the thing that you, would, that you then get. It's not a causal set because it's not tra the relation is not transitive. So you have to, once the... the newly born element has chosen it, the set it wants as its ancestors, you have to add in all the ancestors that are implied by transitivity. So that's, that's the process. It chooses a set of proto-ancestors, you add in at random according to this probability distribution, you add in the ancestors that it should have by transitivity, and that's the end of that stage of process. Okay, so the question, I claim and I will, I'm not going to prove, but I can prove in two minutes if you ask me, that this, um, this, uh, this process, this stochastic process, satisfies that condition of general covariance. That if you calculate the probability of arriving at any causal set, any finite causal set at some stage of the process, then it won't matter how you've how you've generated it. Any other order of births which, will, which results in that causal set will, be, will, um, will give you the same probability. The probability for generating it one way will be the same as the probability for generating it the other way. All right, so 
here are some notes and talking points. This is my last slide. Um, so there's another aspect. So this is a sort of, I don't know what you call it, sort of dynamical expression of general covariance. It's, it's like the, the invariance of the equations of motion of general relativity under, um, or the invariance of the action of general relativity under, um, under diffeomorphism. Um, under diffeomorphisms. So two, two different uh, metrics which are related by diffeomorphism, if you plug them into the Einstein um, Hilbert action, they give you the same, um, the same number. Okay. But there's another aspect of general, at least another aspect of general covariance, or in the discrete context label invariance, which is that physical statements should not for refer to the labels. Um, and this is what Raphael was um, talking about when he was talking about um, the problem of covariant observables. So in these se classical sequential growth models, one can, can give a complete specification of all the possible physical statements. And as Raphael said, this amounts to solving the problem of time in this context. Another important thing to say is that classical sequential growth models don't give us causal sets which are like continuum space times. They are toy models that we're within which we're exploring some of the issues that we expect will also arise in the, uh, in the quantum context. So Graham Brightwell, um, <coughs> who is perhaps the world expert on um, discrete partial orders, um, and one of the very few mathematicians who knows what Minkowski space-time is, uh, <laughs> has proven that classical sequential growth <coughs> models have a continuum limit so the, 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 the causal sets that it generates, that, causal, that sequential growth models generate, do, they, are, they have a continuum approximation, if you like. The continuum approximation is, is really nothing like um, uh, nice Lorentzian manifold, unfortunately. However, there are some manifold-like signatures in causal sets which are, which are generated by these sequential growth dynamics, as um, David Ryder and Matt Paul Ahmed been investigating. So it's, it's a little disappointing, perhaps, although if one, it, if one truly believes in the unity of physics, then maybe that's good. Maybe it, we, we really want to have to go to the, the quantum theory in order to get back um, space time and general relativity. We'll have to look at everything again, those, all of these issues about, uh, about um, discrete general covariance, um, and uh, what quant uh, whether we're, we can hope to get causal sets which are like continuum space time in the light of a quantum dynamics when we have it. Maybe I should say if and when we have it. But now I'll just repeat again um, this issue, which I think um, hopefully we can discuss more. To me, sequential growth models embody the notion of becoming. The birth process is a physical process. There's no physical sense in which either of two elements, space-time atoms, which are not ordered in the resulting causal set, happens first. Their births are not physically ordered. So if in the causal set that you grow, two atoms are not related in the order, in the order of the causal set, then their birth order has no physical meaning. Perhaps we need a new tense here. So, uh, so as far as event, so suppose two space-time atoms, let's call them A and B, are concerned. If event A happens, maybe as for, for A, a new tense is required to talk about B. And in English, it seems that the closest one can get to that new tense is will have happened, perhaps. <laughs> and the, an interesting question is, do other languages have one already, have a, a tense that's a, that is really, really in, encodes the notion that things are happening, <coughs> that, that, that time is local. So we can talk about events here, but the, the notion of something happening over there should not, is not, should not and cannot be tensed into past, future or present. It should be, it, it, there should be some new tense. Right? So will have happened seems about as close as you can get in 
So becoming and lack of a global time. So there's no global time in this in this classical sequential growth model. And I, I, the way I understand it is that it embodies becoming. So this becoming, this coming into being, this 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 process, this birth of elements of, of space and atoms, these peacefully coexist in these models. And it's, to me, it's the discreteness of causal set theory which makes it easier to make sense of this growing block view of the physical world. And I put this in bold, but I, I, that was a mistake. I should not put it in bold because I don't know really what I mean by this. But if you want to associate the present or perhaps our perception of a present <coughs> moment to anything at all in this, in this model, then it's not to any collection of space-time atoms. That's not the way to think about the present. The present isn't, isn't given by any, of the, any, any subset of the, of the causal set. Any collection of space-time atoms is not the present. But the present is the birth process itself. So I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> I'll let you choose. <laughs> no, you both no, came up at the same time. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I look at me. <laughs> okay, good reason not to look at him. <laughs> okay, uh, left to right. One. It doesn't matter about the order. That's not Okay. Too many, too many. Brief. All one, of about, the questions. one about children. Uh, uh, Piaget actually said long ago that. Uh, uh, good, uh, reference to space, the topological concepts uh, precede the emergence or understanding of uh, geometric or uh, projected space. Uh, you might like that. And uh, um, second, in the Dutch language, when you, when you try to make, it's actually your sleeps is sort of conventionalized. People tell their children uh, that you have to wait for stay nachies, two little nights. That's how you measure time. My question. There is no physical sense in which either of the of two elements which are not ordered in and result in the resulting causal set happens first. Their births are not physically ordered. Uh, by, by ordered, do you mean ordered according to ancestry? That just makes it sort of taut sound, makes it sound tautological. <laughs> so, so I don't mean that. It's Neither yes. happens first. It's the same idea. Yes. There's no outside time. So the so the, yes, these yeah. at, these space time atoms, they once they've been born, they exist, and they're and they're ordered. They have this. They have these causal relations to each other. Right. But there's something more to them than just existing. It's that they are they are born. <laughs> they right. there's a, they happen. E e each one happens, and that's. That's part of the physics. That's the idea. So that, that that is really part of the physics. So so there's two kind of orderings here, right? One is the one is the causal. One is the sort of abstract, or it's not abstract because it's physical because it's space time. But the, the, there's the order that they have, the the order relations that they have with each other. But then there's a the physical order in which they happen. And those two things are the same. Th I mean, they needn't have been the same thing. That's the thing. That's the thing to say. So, I I can make a model of a causal set growing, in which the order in which they happen is not the, the is not the causal order. You put some extra structure, some extra information about this one happening before this one, and then it wouldn't be the same thing as the as the as the space time. Yeah, yeah. So, so this model is that. The order in which they're born is, it, it just is the, the, the causal order. So they're not... That they, they, it just is the order that they, the, the order that they have amongst themselves. So they're not, they're not coming into being on a kind of, uh, on a kind of background. No, of exactly right. Absolutely. Right. In fact, that's the whole point. Please remember exactly to keep right. it brief, so it's we're exactly going right. left to right, front to back. So, <laughs> <laughs> so left to right, side <laughs> <coughs> okay, it's very good that it's my turn now, because it's exactly about what you were saying. Let me try to be precise. Uh, you just said there are two orderings in some sense. So if I just separate the, uh, so just separate the mathematics from the wording for a moment, 
it strikes me that in your mathematics, in fact, you did talk about uh, two temporalities. One, just you take one causal set, single yes. one, and there is a, a, a notion of causality, mm -hmm. which you can say this is later, earlier, mm -hmm. this is one the problem. Mm -hmm. Then you introduce another one, mm -hmm. which is what you call the birth process. Mm -hmm. okay? And so this is the second one. That's one you want to uh, somehow relate to becoming. However, you also tell us that the second one, you talk about process, okay? And then you say the birth process is physical. But a few slides before, you said this birth process is careful, this is not physical, because I have to take equivalence relation, equivalence relation between different processes. So I have to identify physically two processes that go to the same uh, structure. And so what are the equivalence classes of the birth of the gauging uh, of the gauge of the birth processes, well, you just said it. They turn out to be precisely the causal sets, the causal sets. So at the end of the day, you construct a story for introducing the coming, which up to gauge recollapses to just the causal set. So it seems to me, if I, if I look at this, this sounds more like a story that would please uh, our what well, universe. Friends than uh, George. Hello? Which is what I was trying to say to Raphael earlier. Sorry? I was trying to make that point to Raphael earlier, but that's much better. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Face, comment. Um. It could have been otherwise. I mean, I can, I could. I could produce a process in which the birth order is physical, in the sense that the probability of arriving at some particular causal set is different depending on the order that that was born. So, so then the the that model, that physical model, wouldn't embody. General covariance. It wouldn't embody the discrete version of general covariance. It wouldn't be something which we, which, from which we could hope to get general relativity. It would. It has introduced some background structure, and one could hope that that background structure would go away and some continue. But it's very likely that it would just persist and that we wouldn't get to So, so maybe you just can't see becoming in this. But all I can say is that to me, it, it, it. It's as much as I could imagine a physical theory doing to give you becoming. That's, that's, yeah. It's a good, it's, it's a very good question, and there are issues which I kind of swept under the carpet about the fact that this stopping the process at any finite stage is also is a meaningless thing to talk about because, for example, one could ask. Does a particular subcausal set occur in the causal set? Um, does it occur in the causal set? And it's something that you can't answer until you've run the whole, until you've run the process to, to infinity. So the, this is this sort of global aspect of, of observables um, that, that general covariance brings in. So, so yeah, there's something. I mean, yeah, I there's something that I haven't. Haven't brought out, which is probably the, the aspect that you're that you're that you're picking up on. But we can maybe discuss it. I think my question is, is strongly related, but let me try to put it in, in slightly different words. Every cause set is in a sense a sort of model of the universe of space time, a discrete model, but it has spatial and temporal relations built into it. And so, if you consider this this growth, uh, this is more like a transition from one space-time model to the next space-time model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not something that happens within time. It's not. It's a, so I think it's confusing to call it a process. Even more to call it a physical process. It, because it's, that, depends, that suggests to me that you have some other idea of what the physics is apart from, are already apart in from the, the models. Models, so. 
the idea is that there's something more than just the temp that's <laughs> there's some, the idea is something that there's something more than just the temporal relations within the causal set in this model. That there is a process. And that's, I, I don't. Is it a failure of language? Is there some other word to use apart from process? So, 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 I mean, it's, as Raphael says, we're using different metaphors. Different yeah. metaphors. So birth, is that a better word? Birth is well, a I, I can, I can action. see how things happen within <laughs> the same space time. I'm just not sure what it means to go to another space time or model of space time. Yeah, Each yeah. model is the process run to infinity. The analog of a traditional blockhead space-time model is one of these processes allowed to go to infinity, not stopping after 17 atoms of being born. Yeah. yeah. But I was not so much considering this, uh, the blockhead. But... Um, I, I, I have the worry which has been expressed by uh, <coughs> Carlo, so let me ask another question. So you expressed uh, a preference for starting with the conclusion. My question is, could God have that preference in this kind of world um, and make it a shrinking block, shrinking from the future towards the past, rather than a, a growing block? And this is related to the distinction I drew in my talk between the issue of directionality and the issue of, of, of becoming. I think they're independent issues. Uh, and it seems to me the most attractive version of this would be an attraction where, where the becoming was essentially thought of as undirected um, um, because I, I can't see that there's any way independent that you're going to get an answer to the question as to... Your view is that you start with an infinite causal set and take yes, balance yes, away. Yes, yes, and you take bits away according, according to, in effect, the, the jewel of these rules. That wouldn't work because... Sorry, I can... But the dual of the rules would have to be constructed. If I, I'm not sure it could even be constructed in a sort of. You'd have to start with these transition probabilities, build up the measure on the set of all completed causal sets, and then do something to that. Is if, that if, if there's a physical process which generates it one way, then there's. And, and if there's a sense in which that has a direction, then um, it seems to me that it's trivial that there's a physical process which generates. Ah, but that's direction. not the, the thing you end up with is infinite. So if you take points away from it, it'll just remain infinite. But, but why, How why, would you get down to why, why can't a single time be, Why can't time be infinite in the past? Very good question. We simply failed to find models that could that models that would embody discrete general covariance and this causality, this bell causality. We just if someone can come up with one, that would be interesting. I mean, I would find that very interesting. So I think we just couldn't build any models like that that were infinite in the past. There was something, yeah, that, not that we, no, could, we no, can't no. claim that, we, that yeah, there I cannot be such models. I think we should take this up later. I think yeah. I haven't been. Yeah, let's try not to turn this into a discussion of, for each question. So let's try to be brief. So it's brief. Question. It's brief, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about the kind of general covariance. So you claim that it's giving you some aspects of general relativity, but it seems like, or, or you need it in order to be able to get to general relativity. I suspect that, that label invariance will be essential to. That's the thing, so it seems like the sort of a Kretschmann y type of objection might arise. So I can, I can label this a cup or a balloon, but it's not going to alter the, you know, the physical properties and what happens when we put it in experiments and stuff. This is a really trivial notion of, of it's labeling variance, but this seems to be like the label invariance that's being used here. It's not really going to give you something like general relativity. Well, it's There's a whole bunch of theories that you would expect to meet this kind of. It's more, this kind well, of. it's more than that in this case because it's it's the it's the dynamics doesn't care about the labels. It's the the dynamics is expressed. First of all, well, first of all, it's expressed in a label dependent way because you need this order. But then you. Then you, you show that it's just pure gauge and doesn't have it doesn't doesn't have any. Meaning. So it's, it's dynamic. It's uh, when you say that two uh, such atoms have 
after being born, choose whether one will be after the other or vice versa. I'm referring to this part. Yes, so what, well, one is born already and, and exists, and then the second one is born, and it has, the second one is the one that does the choosing. So it chooses either to be causally in the future of the first one or, or unrelated. I guess it can also choose whether it wants to be especially close to, to that atom or far away from it. No, that's the thing. It, it, the that idea is that yeah, the idea is that it that, that there's only that in the order information that it needs to mm -hmm. choose. It doesn't choose any metrical information, and that the metrical information will is encoded in the for a large enough causal set, one which is like a manifold. It's encoded in the relations themselves. The metrical information is encoded. In Yeah, this is another flat-footed question along the lines of David Hartman's before. Um, so, as I see, the, the original broadhead versus blockhead um, discussion was that the blockhead says to the broadhead, listen, the only reason why you think the way you do about becoming itself is because of where you're located within what's actually a block universe. It's a feature of your perspective within the block universe. Um, but, but actually, once you realize that, um, then you can see that um, it's only because um, of your external perspective or whatever that, that you think of reality itself as, um, as part of, or time itself as passing. But um, that's to do with where you are. Um, now, suppose you kind of accept that bit of the argument, um, then it looks like somebody might say about the move that you're making that you're saying, actually, there's also something perspective-dependent about the blockhead's view, um, because those block universes, um, or the kind of growing blocks evolved into infinity, are themselves part of a, we have to think of them as part of a larger structure. Um, and why isn't the same move appropriate here to say it's just all matter of perspective, and there isn't really a you haven't introduced anything that now um, would just start <coughs> talking about the genuine growth or moving or passage or anything like that. It's just you make the, exactly the same move again of saying, here's a, here's a bigger structure in which what we thought of was the block universe is, is located, but which block universe we're in is just a matter of our, our perspective. Sorry, that. Happened. Yes, I'm not sure I understood your question. What's the larger structure? Yeah. So, I, I, I think in, in response to Dave Dalvin, who said, I think of this really as a physical growing or so on. And, and I think there's a, there's a quite familiar argument in various areas of philosophy where, where people say, actually, you've left something out. Um, you've left something out by giving me what looks like the big picture because there's something that I'm experiencing that isn't really accounted for. And the response to that is very often um, to say, actually, what you think is not accounted for is a feature of your perspective because you're located within that structure so, rather than a feature that's. Yeah, so all I can common. say is that I mean, these models are not created in order to you know, give, give our perception of becoming a place in physics. But it wasn't, they weren't created in that way, though. That, that was not the purpose. And not Although, once we had them, it, well, I'm speaking for myself now, once we had them, to me, it was an attractive feature of them that they embodied <coughs> becoming. I mean, is it fair to say that, that, that an, a, the notion of a growing block is compatible with our understanding of, of perception, perception of the flow of time? It's just as compatible as the as a blockhead's view. Oh. I would think so. So then it's maybe it's you know maybe then it's metaphysics, which can only be resolved by the success or failure of a, of a program. You know, if, if this program of quantum gravity has you know bears fruit and is successful, then to me that would that would be. 
that would be meaningful in this debate. But I mean, at the moment, maybe it's you know, it's just it's just metaphysical. Right. So life is tough, and we have to stop. But it's also nice, and we're going for lunch. And you can ask all the other questions over lunch. Let's thank. <laughs>